this morning's keynote speaker is a perfect example of an individual working to create a better world. Derry Kayongo and his family fled a civil war in Uganda and settled in the United States when he was only 10 years old. He is now a renowned expert in environmental sustainability and global health. He is the founder of the Global Soap Project, which takes donated, melted, and purified and reprocessed hotel soap and redistributes it to vulnerable populations all around the world. So currently there are 5,500 hotels that are members of the Global Soap Project Recycling Program here in the United States. And the program has expanded to 90 countries. So Global Soap recently partnered with Clean the World to make an even more expansive and effective organization. Derek is also the former CEO of the National Center for Civil Rights, which capitalizes on the management and leadership experience he has developed over the last 20 years, working for Nobel Peace Prize winning organizations like Amnesty International and the American Friends Service Committee. So let's meet Derek. Our next hero survived unspeakable horrors, a civil war in Uganda, and a refugee camp in Kenya. He then eventually arrived in America. Derek Kayango landed in the city of brotherly love. He spent his first night in a hotel and was amazed by what he saw by the bathroom sink. Soap. Three kinds of it. Face soap, hand soap, and body soap. And because of where he came from, he had no idea there were so many. So Derek did what everybody does. He put a couple of bars in his bag and used one. The next day, it had all been replaced. He quickly ran to the front desk, gave the bars back, and asked for his old soap. He thought they were charging him for it, and he couldn't afford it, of course. Then he realized what they were really doing. They were throwing it all away. And in that moment, Derek had a life-saving idea. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Derek Kiongo. Beautiful stuff. Oh my God. Good morning. Bonjour. Habari. Oh, wow. Really? <laughs> We're going to have fun then. If you guys can speak more than one language, that's a good sign. I want to thank uh, Cynthia and your team. Give them a big round of applause for a wonderful job. It's always refreshing to know that you're going to a planners meeting and everything is planned well. I was worried about that, Cynthia. But I got picked up properly, I got put into a beautiful hotel room and then brought here. You guys are really planners. So I'm going to talk to you about planning in Uganda where I'm from and see where that works actually the same way. But I'm told that I have about five hours to speak to you this morning. <laughs> what? I'm African and we can do this all day. Uh, Eva will be very mad at me if I do that. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about my personal story and use that story to get you back into your profession and to show you how important your work is. Because after all, as Cynthia well mentioned, without planners, it's very hard to do all of this. It's very, very hard. And so for me, I am so excited to be here because every time I speak to a group that is really relevant to the subject matter, I really go very hard. It's harder to speak to you know, like accountants. It's really hard to make a joke with accountants. <laughs> In 1979, my parents and I woke up to an incredible experience. We had gunshot out of the apartment that we lived in. My father looked out of the apartment and saw a soldier wielding an AK-47. 
And in Swahili, which is an amalgam of Bantu languages and Arabic, he said the following. Get out of your apartments right now. Get out. And my father looked out and realized that he was serious and we were in big trouble. And he looked back at us and said, let's go out of the apartment because if he comes into the apartment, he'll kill us. So we get out of the apartment and we were hoarded off to this roundabout station where we found an amazing sin. It turned out they had rounded up the whole village. And as I looked around, I saw my friends, Masko and Kukuli and her son. And they were with their parents crying. And I realized, ah, this is a bad day. The same soldier comes up to a rostrum as big as that one. And he says the following with a bullhorn. Everybody be quiet. Be quiet. Simmer down. Last night, two of my soldiers were killed. And I'm here to figure out who did that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a firing squad until you tell me what happened last night. A firing squad. We were all aghast at this particular accusation because in any civilized society, what happens when a crime like that is committed? You investigate the crime. You, you, you police it. Well, he did not. And so very quickly, as we quieted down in disgust, he pointed four people out in the audience. One, two, three, four. Come up. And as he pointed those four, and they were brought up to the front, he asked the question again. To no avail, he took out a pistol and shot all four of them at once. The cacophony that ensued after that was unbelievable as mothers were screaming and crying and holding on to their kids. We were so disorganized and we were so shocked at this particular behavior. And he yelled out again, be quiet everybody, be quiet. We're going to do this all day until you tell me what happened last night. All day. And as we quieted down, he put another four out. One, two, Three, four, come up. And as those four were pointed out, neighbors started to point at each other saying, he picked you. Because they knew very well that going up there meant a gunshot. Can you imagine right now? APA, your neighbor right now pointing at you saying you committed a crime knowing very well you're going to be expired. And so against their will, those four are brought up to the front he asked the question again to no avail. Those four gunshots rang out again. That was eight. Before I could bring up another four, a young man at the very back rose up his hand and said, I, I, I did it. And we looked back to look at who this kid was. And it turns out he was a visitor on the village and there's no way he would have done that particular crime. And they bring it up to the front. There's a little bit of banter between the two of them. And as I closed my eyes, Cynthia, that gunshot rang out again. And I could hear the body fall to the ground. And that was nine. That soldier then looks up at us and says, thank you so much for your cooperation. I hope this never happens again. And he drives off in his motorcade and leaves us in disarray. I was 10 years old watching adults, adults who are supposed to take care of us and love us, destroy not just my little village on Lubaga Road, but destroy a whole country. And I wondered as a child, what is it about adults that doesn't understand the power of bringing up a young child and raising that young child in love and honesty and protection? What is it about adults? But I want you to park that grotesque picture here for a second. Let me walk you back and show you who Derek was and from whence I've come. Because after all, I was a lovely little child. <laughs> so here we go. I'm originally Ugandan. Who knows where Uganda is? Really? 
Okay, I just asked that question in Santa Barbara recently, and a lady said, I know where it is. I said, where is it, young lady? And she says, south of San Diego because of your accent. <laughs> Which is why I don't trust American education anymore. It's, uh, <laughs> why would you do that? But Uganda is a small little country in East Africa. It's the size of Oregon, and we as Ugandans pride ourselves. Oregon, oh! We get one from Oregon, please. I'll take Oregon for 500. Ugandans pride themselves in not only being tall and handsome. What? But also, we are the home and the source of the Nile. Now, the Ethiopians think they're the source of the Nile because we have the blue Nile and the white Nile, but they're not here to give the speech, so we are the source of the Nile. <laughs> we are also uh, runners, yeah? We run like heck. Every time I see the Boston Marathon and I see Americans running, I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh. You're going to lose. <laughs> the Kenyans are here. The Ugandans are here. Oh. But recently I'm told that an American woman won. Yeah. Uh, the Me Too movement is really moving fast, I think. Uh. But you know what we call that in Africa when an American woman wins? A defect. Oh, shut up. We bathed you and we love you so much. You're all Africans anyway. <laughs> uh, we also pride ourselves in having the best pineapple in the world. The first time I saw a pineapple in the US, I was like, oh. America, you can make a pineapple great again. Oh, you guys are naughty. <laughs> you got that joke, huh? I said that joke in Kansas City did not go very well, Cynthia. I <laughs> but we love that little country, and uh, my, my parents and I were excited about the country because we were getting independence from the British, and we knew we were going to build a brand new country. So the British leave, and they hand us a country. And, you know, this country, you know, is, is so good. Gandhi's ashes, some of his ashes are buried out there. But my parents reinvent themselves because as teachers, they realize very quickly that teaching doesn't pay very well in Uganda. Do teachers get paid well in the US? We gotta do something about that. And so they reinvent themselves. They're like, they, they say, forget teaching, we're gonna make a brand new business. And right before my eyes at a very young age, at the age of five, I start to see these two people change. This is what I look like at that age. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> I have only two photographs of me at that age because we lost all our albums in the war. So that's Derek watching mom and dad change everything. My mother became a wedding gown seamstress. And she taught herself how to sew and do all this stuff and build beautiful wedding gowns. The only thing is that she didn't have mannequins for flower girl dresses, so guess who the mannequin was? <laughs> yes, you're right, me. Which is why I dress better than any man at this particular <laughs> conference. I dare. Uh, my son hits that joke because I tell my son, Kevin, your father's been a cross-dresser since he was five. <laughs> and he always says, stop it, don't say that. I'm in high school, you're embarrassing me. You embarrass me all the time. So. But I became very comfortable with my pinks, and uh, she and I loved each other, and through this whole, and she built the second largest David's Bridal in the country, and became very wealthy. My father, in juxtaposition, became a soap maker. We're going to talk about soap in a minute. And together they did very well. I went to private schools. I enjoyed being taught by the British and everything. And 
This is what they look like. That's mom and dad. And I bring them up because parents are important. Am I right? Uh, we give you, as a nation, as a country, as the world, a child. When we raise a good child as parents, we give you a good child. So those are the two that walked me through this whole process. And then the war began. Guess who got into power? Idi Amin. If you've not watched the movie, go watch it. It's in the movies right now about how Idi Amin fought the, 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 the Jews. Idi Amin hated Jewish people big time. In fact, Benjamin Netanyahu's brother, you guys familiar with Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel right now, his brother was shot in Uganda by Idi Amin. He also hated Indians, Indian Ugandans who had lived there for 70 years, got rid of all of them. And then he hated elites, people like you. And so my father and I and my mom lose everything and we become refugees in Kenya. My father brings me to Kenya to become a refugee and puts me in the hands of an American woman to raise me and goes back to fight Idi Amin. How many of you have ever met American women before? <laughs> in particular, American women from Pittsburgh. <laughs> okay. They're crazy. <laughs> Marge Campbell was, Americans are very loud and obnoxious, am I right? You should meet them. They are ridiculous compared to the British. The British are very what? Hello, Derek. Good morning. How do you do? Americans, what's up? <laughs> so the first time I meet Marge, she's loud and, hello, Derek, and she's obnoxious and fantastic and loud and, uh. and I said, oh, good God. <laughs> and she says, Derek, would you care for a cup of tea? And I said, absolutely, Marge, I'd love a cup of tea. Thank you. <laughs> she runs to the kitchen, gets a cup of tea, runs back, gets me the cup of tea, and runs back to the kitchen. And I take a little sip of the tea. Oh. It's cold. Four par. So I set it back down, and she comes back. And Cynthia, she does something American women do that I want you to help me help all the other men also in the room understand. What does it mean when an American woman does this? <laughs> what is that? Express yourself. <laughs> and I said to her, well, are you okay, darling? And she says, well, wh what is wrong? I said, I think you forgot to cook the tea. <laughs> she says, no, that's American iced tea. You should love it. <laughs> I said, okay, you still forgot to cook it. <laughs> and she and I began a friendship that was amazing. You see, Marge had left Pittsburgh to become a missionary in Kenya to raise African kids who are refugees. And that sacrifice for me begins this idea of how giving back to people and looking at people wherever they are and investing in them. And so, the first thing Marge does is she shows me she's contrarian on everything. Marge gives me Cookies. What do the British eat? Biscuits. But I've been here long enough to know what you guys do with biscuits. <laughs> you give them to your dogs, don't you? <laughs> you bloody bastards. <laughs> if she says we're going to watch football, what does she mean? No, she does not. <laughs> she means football, meaning carrying the ball and running with it. If it's baseball, what do we watch? Cricket. Totally contrarian. But then we grow to love each other, and she gets me a chance to come to the US to go to school. 
And I come to the U.S. and land in the city of what? Brotherly love. What city is that? Oh, Philadelphia. Mm. Where they eat uh, meat <laughs> and with bread in the middle of it and call it a cheesesteak. And it's this long. <laughs> and I check into a hotel like Laura Dan just mentioned. And in the hotel, it's my first time as an African child to really get into a big, big hotel. And I'm looking around, I'm like, oh my God, this is fantastic. I get into the bathroom, and in the bathroom, there are three bars of soap. Facial soap, body soap, and hand washing soap. What's the difference? No, Americans, seriously, what's the difference? <laughs> zero. No, ze no, 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 no difference at all. It's Americans being bougie. <laughs> really? Facial soap? But now, my father made soap. Now I'm thinking, he never told me there's facial soap, body soap, and hand. Now I'm thinking, where's my bat soap? <laughs> where's my uncle soap? What, what's going on over here? Ah, no, 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 no. There's that adage that says there's no free lunch in this country, so I take the two bars, put them in my bag for another day, and I come back that evening, and what do you think they had done? They brought more soap. But I'm a former refugee. I'm going to steal the heck out of that soap. Am I right? So I take the two bars. I stole soap for three days. How many of you steal soap from hotels on occasion? <laughs> you bloody bastards. Welcome to the club. <laughs> and then I realized that they're going to charge me for the soap. So I take all the little soaps. I had a lot of that stuff back down to the concierge to give it back. When I get down to the concierge, he's African-American. <laughs> I had never met an African-American before. My only experience with African-Americans was with that movie, uh, Coming to America, with Eddie Murphy. <laughs> Man, I was, I was, I could not wait to say, yo, what's up, brother? Because, <laughs> you know, African Americans are so cool. Even the way they walk is cool. None of us walk like that. You know that little bounce, you know that? <laughs> in rhythm, all the time. You could put on the macarena and they would be in rhythm. Which is why I joke all the time. That's why they're late, because they're always trying to give us a little rhythm thing, you know? Come on, let's go. You're making us all look bad. I met Dave Chappelle. You guys know Dave Chappelle? And I said to him, Dave, you know, you're not that funny. <laughs> you know who's funny? He said, who? He said, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> That's funny. And so he and I uh, meet, and I go up to him, and I say, what's up, brother? He says, what's up, young man? And he's elegant. And I say, I have a secret for you. He says, what? I said, I've been stealing your soap. He's like, what? <laughs> like from housekeeping? I said, no, no, you keep on bringing me soap, and I can't afford it. Take it back to housekeeping and tell them to charge me for it. He burst out laughing. <laughs> and he said, are you African? Are you Nigerian? Because we're all Nigerians to you guys, yeah? <laughs> you guys think we're all Nigerians, you know? We're the ones that send you that email that says, my father just died. <laughs> and left me with a billion dollars. If you could please share your social security number, your bank account, we could share the money. Don't do that. And so we banter back and forth, and we're laughing at each other. And uh, he says, no, no, Derek, don't worry about the soap. You see all these Americans over here, they steal soap too, so you're good, brother. I was like, really? They said, ah, oh, don't, don't worry about it. So as I walk away from him, a thought comes back to mind. What about the partially used bar of soap? So I go back to him, and I say, what about the partially used bar of soap? And he says, well, we throw those away. 
I said, like, like this hotel or every hotel in the U.S.? He said, every hotel in the U.S. And I went back to my room and APA, I lost it. Because all of a sudden, an epiphany happens. I'm the child of a man that made soap and didn't think much about soap. I thought soap, everybody had soap. I thought so. Then became that child became that, would be, that became a refugee. And so the power of soap. Can you imagine if you're a woman in this room right now and you're a refugee girl giving birth to a child and a midwife comes to help you deliver a child and without washing their hands, they go into your womb to deliver a child and they leave a germ in your womb that kills you in two weeks. It's called childbed fever. If you're a child, think about having diarrhea diseases every day and having to stay out of school because you have to fight diarrhea diseases, ringworm, hookworm, lice. I realized how powerful soap was then. And then you come to this country, this great country, and they throw away soap. I knelt on my bed and I cried. And I had two choices. One, I could look at this country and say how wasteful you are. How wasteful you are. Or, I could look at this country and say, when I was flying into this country, I saw what? Ellis Island. And what is Ellis Island, APA? Ellis Island is this signal that when you come to this country, you come to build, to construct, to innovate, to become an entrepreneur. We come here to construct life as we know it in its splendor of cooperation. We are all from everywhere. In fact, there's an American movie that says uh, by Hank Thomas, uh, to, uh, Tom, Tom Hanks, I think is his name, there's no crying in what? In baseball. So you either come here to whine and scream, oh, it's horrible, or you come here and build all of this. And I chose to come and do what? Build all of this. So I'm going to walk you quickly through the journey of how I moved from being a refugee child to becoming what? A constructor. This is uh, my hotel room. That's the bar of soap. I want you to conjure up the number of soaps that you think are thrown away every year by hotels. Put a number in your mind, and I'm going to bring up the number. You tell me whether that's the number you have in your mind, okay? This is what happens when soap is thrown away. These are the numbers. Eight hundred million bars of soap every single year. That is 2.6 million bars of soap every single day. Ah, I see that number, as an American, what do you see? When you see that number, you see what? Opportunity. Everybody else around the world sees waste, which is fine. So how do we recycle soap? Number one, who can yell out just out of there? Because there's something that you guys are thinking about when I say recycling soap. The first thing you guys are thinking about, let me bring it up and see whether you guys think about the same thing, yeah? Recycle soap. There it is. Yeah? What else comes to mind? <laughs> you guys are thinking that. The yak factor. My yak factor, my business, was germs. Every business has a yak factor. What is your yak factor? Bureaucracy? Coding? I'm told some of you went to the haunted houses to see ghosts yesterday, and the first thing that some of you were asking was, did they get what code this was supposed to be? Because your planners, are the ghosts passing through? Yak factors are important because they give us an opportunity to solve problems. And so the first question for me was, how do you get rid of the germs on the soap without destroying the pH system of the soap? That was the first question that was brought to my mind. And the answer is what? 
What do you think I did to kill the germs without getting rid of the pH system of the soap? I melted it. How expensive do you think that is? Very expensive. No, I did not. The second thing is the power of observation. I'm sleeping in bed one night, one morning, and I'm watching TV, and this guy comes up to shop a new thing, and he has a piece of meat, little plastic bag, puts the piece of meat in the plastic bag, and then sucks out the air, and creates a vacuum, and the meat lasts for 5,000 years. <laughs> I jump out of bed, I said, I go downstairs to my basement, I look at the soap, I crush the soap, go get the little contraption, put the soap in the little contraption, suck the air out, wait for two weeks, and I come back and I take it back to the FD and I say, check and see whether there are any germs in there. And they call me two weeks later and say, Derek, I say, hello? I say, what did you do to clean the, you killed, you killed the germs? How did you do it? I said, all of them? They said, yes, all of them. And the soap is still intact? He said, yes, the soap is still intact. <laughs> if you give me the patent, I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> Very expensive. No, it was easy. The power of observation is very cool. So here we do. We peel the soap. We then crush the soap into a powder. We then ziplock it into these big commercial bags. And then awaken the soap after two weeks. That's the first little contraption I used there. It's a cement mixer, experimentation. Then we add a little bit of water to it. And we create a feather cheese texture because you want to put it through the machine and then you press the machine through and then the soap comes out and this is what you get. That's one day's work of brand new soap. University of Michigan students helping me recycle soap. And then fashion. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we take samples out of the batch to Cincinnati to test for pathogens. When there are no pathogens on the soap, we know we're ready to ship back home. And then we have a full container of 160,000 bars of soap going to Liberia. Why Liberia? Because of Ebola. You guys remember Ebola? And we're going to use soap to teach behavior of hand washing. Number three, yak factor was one, two was observation, three was crisis. Crisis is good for innovation. Ah. So there's a crisis in Liberia about people dying with Ebola, but we're going to teach kids how to wash their hands. You know, Cynthia, what happens when you give an American woman a gift? What do you guys say? Thank you. Thank you. Do you know what an, Amer an African woman says when you give them a gift, a mama? You want to see what they say? <laughs> They dance, they scream, they laugh, they cry, and then if you're lucky, they give you their daughter to marry. <laughs> I have 5,000 wives. Uh, I just told that joke in Utah, it did not go very well. So. <laughs> Utah is the most African state in the Union. Just realize that. I, I tell all my African friends, go to Utah. They like us over there. <laughs> I love stereotypes. They're great. <laughs> We've just landed back home, and I'm getting ready to give the soap away. And those are my wives. Girls love soap. Boys don't. In fact, um, I just read a little thing in a, in a men's bathroom. And when you go to restaurants, you go to men's bathroom, they have a little sign that says, every employee do what? Wash your hands. The rest of us don't have to. <laughs> you know who came up with that? A boy. Which is why in my tradition, we don't say hello this way. We say hello this way. Hello, don't touch me, you bloody bastard, don't touch me. How are you doing? 
May the gods be with you. Because if you do this, what happens? You transmit the what? The germs. Girls drop out of school back home in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, South Asia, because boys make fun of them for not washing their hands. That impacts our economies. But I'm going to stop here for a second and show you why this is important to your conference today. For planning to happen, you need good governance. If the governments don't work properly and efficiently, it's hard for you guys to do your work. What's, this is why you talked about advocacy. We've got to have responsible leaders in power. People back at home ask me, how did you build the Global South Project in, in the US? What, how did you do that? You are, you are new to the country. How did you do that? I said, because the US is organized. I know, who talk to, I know who to talk to. I don't have to talk to everybody's brother and sister and pay everybody a greet, you know? I don't have to be corrupt. The first thing in planning is that to make it happen, we've got to have good governors. Uganda does not have good governors. And that's why Idi Amin creates the worst scenario for people like yourselves. Number two, for effective planning to happen, you, you have to be organized. You've got to be what? Innovative. Innovation doesn't stop. It always goes on. That's why you guys are talking about new communities and how you're going to build new communities. And I hope recycling is part of it. Because the new human being cannot afford to consume at the levels we're consuming right now. So creating communities that are, are responsible and that are, are understanding of the environment means that we are going to live a healthy life. When you plan with innovation, and when you're smart in your innovation, and you include a lot of diversity in that innovation, we as human beings are going to live a good life. There's nothing as bad as going to a city that is not planned. It looks interesting, yeah? You should try and drive a car in Uganda. We have no traffic lights. It's more like this. You idiot! No, you idiot! It's my turn! No, it's your turn! No! You and it's... Traffic lights are the simplest analogy. That's planning. I will leave you <laughs> with what it means to do self. Uh, if you're lucky, they give you children as well <laughs> to bring back. Um, from the basement, to now 90 countries around the world. From a refugee to recycling soap. That all is planning. And to do that, I had to come up with a little thing called SELF. SELF is an acronym that means service for ACE. Uh, this association has to have members that are in service of the community at all times. Because in serving the community, you get to learn the power of what? The needs of the community. And that's when innovation begins. And that learning is what we call education on the streets. And if you see the needs of the community, then you know how important it is. You know, cholera, I was looking at the, how cholera began in London. It was based on planning, actually or misplanning, yeah? The sewer waters merged with what? The clean waters. And people got cholera. In other words, if you guys don't do a good job, we're screwed. <laughs> After you get educated about things, then you can become a leader. I, I hear about leadership all the time, and I, I tell people, you cannot go out there and lead if you've never served and if you're not educated about what his needs, the needs of the community are. That's how leaders are made. Leaders are not born. Because if they're born, we should go to the hospital right now and pick up one to lead us and get rid of Cynthia. 
for Cynthia to be here, she served you first. She's educated about the issues you actually saw in her talent. That's how it works. And then lastly, faith. if Cynthia as a leader does not have faith in you as an association, nothing works. It's not faith to be uh, an Episcopalian, no, or a Methodist. Faith in others, and Idi Amin did not have faith in us as a people, and he governed us with, as a reprobate and killed many of our people. And look where we are. We, are. we are all over the world, which is good now, probably. But is Uganda missing out on something remarkable? Yes. So when you build yourself first, then you're going to build a community that reflects that moral aptitude. And that's what we need going forward. Communities that understand the importance of everybody. Why? Because Derek's story is not possible if you don't give me a chance. And so I chose to come to the US and went to school in a small school in Boston that we won't mention. Very expensive school and somebody invested in me an American did. Give me a chance. Fred paid $50,000 every year for me to go to this elite school. And when you see that, and you see on this end a man destroying a country, and on this end a man investing in a child, and that woman Marge investing in me and taking care of me, I had nothing to do but to say, I'm going to become an American. And I became an American, and you should have seen me the first time I voted. I cried all night. I had never voted in my, in my entire life. Why? Because you gave me a chance. As planners, you've got to really figure out a way to create communities that give people a chance. I will leave you with a quote before I teach you an African song. I know you're planners and you, you're absolutely perfect. Am I right? Yeah. You guys are perfect? That's a lie. Perfection is hard. As Africans, we know that perfection is hard. But what we have found as an older people, as Africans, is that balance is more important. A balanced person, a balanced association, a balanced group of people know that the extremes don't work very well. Seek balance. Consistency is important. In your work, in everything you do, when I was consistent in trying to recycle soap and people called it the yak thing and the said, why do people need soap like that? And I was consistent in the idea that I am going to solve this problem. I now have three factories. One in Vegas, why Vegas? A lot of hotels. I call that sin soap. <laughs> That's where Americans go to sin. Then I have one in Orlando, why Orlando? Mickey Mouse, yeah? I highly recommend that one. We have one in Hong Kong. And out of that consistency was this idea of having passion. You talked about passion. I don't like following people who have no passion. How was your day? Well, you know, it was kind of good, you know. How is work? Well, you know, we, we do what we do. How is your life? Well, you know. Living it up. <laughs> Stop it. Get out of here. You're boring. We need passion because out of passion, we can change things. Ask Napoleon Bonaparte. He came back and was passionate. We were like, we got to go back and fight the British. We got to go back. Passion is remarkable because it creates what? Innovation and fun and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs are passionate all the time. This association should be fun and passionate about its work all the time. Because out of that, you will make our lives much better. Oh my goodness, I, I, I can feel the energy of your innovation if you have passion. My friend uh, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren, yeah? I said, Rick, purpose is 
Without passion is like having a Bentley without gas. Yeah? We all have purpose, but do you have passion? Oh my goodness, you, you should try passion. You, can't work to, you cannot wait to get up every morning. And that's what I got. Well, as soon as I landed in this country, I just saw passion. I mean, if you land in Philadelphia and you go to New York, do you see passion? Yeah. New Orleans last night, there was passion around here. There's a lot of passion in New Orleans. Jimny crickets. I want to thank you for letting this young boy from Africa to come in this great country and to build a business that is changing people's lives around the world. When you give a refugee a chance, this is what we look like. We are handsome. <laughs> we're ele elegant, we're tough, we're strong. You've given me a chance, you've given my brother a chance. My brother is now a, 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 a medical doctor, John Hopkins, a, a tenured professor in liver and kidney transplants at the age of 34. You've given us a chance. Americans, we want to thank you so much for loving us, for taking care of us. Don't stop that. As you plan the lives of many of us, to whom much is given, much is expected. So I want you to stand right now for a second Um, African music is very easy. <laughs> um, we're going to start this conference with passion, am I right? Yeah. 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 And we're going to leave this room uh, knowing that the inspiration is that you are alive and well, and you're doing well, and you're going to go back out there and do remarkable stuff. The, the words of the song, I read my lips as one of the American presidents once said, and repeat after me. Moyoni, moyoni. Moyoni, moyoni. Nimempata. Nimempata. Buana. Moyoni. Okay? Uh, here's the tune. Moyoni, moyoni, nimempata bwana, moyoni. That's it. Now, here are the rules. <laughs> if you're white <laughs> and cannot dance, Look around for a brother <laughs> and just fake it <laughs> till you make it. If you can sing, sing loudly. But if you cannot sing, <laughs> spare us. <laughs> Rule number three, uh, you cannot sing the song like an Episcopalian priest, OK? I'm Episcopalian. Eh? You're boring. Stop it. I've seen you guys dance when Earth, Wind, and Fire plays, so I want to see that. Okay? So I want a little bit of that action. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh. I want you to, eh, Menyeka, eh? Uh, so here we go. Moyoni, moyoni. That's the song. Then I'm going to put in some carrots and onion, and I'm going to say, Moyoni Mwangu, keep singing. Moyoni, hey, Moyoni. That's an African word. Don't run out of the room. <laughs> it's a click. If I sing, 
keep singing. Because if you stop, the train will have moved and you try to jump on back in and we'll hear you jump in and you suck. So don't lose us on the way. So let's try it and come to me, okay? Moyoni, moyoni, yes. Mempata buana, mo. Come to me, mama. Moy. Hey, moy. Hey, mempata buana, mo. Good, we got the song. Now, those of you who are Episcopalian can leave. Because I'm starting this conference off with a bang. I'm, I'm serious. I need to say this. Can I see that? Or are you guys too planned to... <laughs> the planners are not dancers. Uh-oh. Okay, come on, Cynthia. One, two, three. Moyoni. Give me volume. Moyoni. Yeah. Men pata buana mo. Moyoni mwangu mo. Tikoshe aye mo. Tikoshe aye. Men pata buana mo. Moyo. Moyo. Men pata buana mo. Tikoshe aye moyo. Yemo. Ababa men pata buana moyoni. I love you, Epie. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much.